Sup, you beautiful bastards. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. I missed you over the three-day weekend, but I'm gonna make up that lost time to you by giving you an extra large show today, because we got a lot of news to talk about. We're talking about one of the most insane harassment campaigns orchestrated by, of all people, eBay, this Mia Khalifa scandal. Things are getting wild with the Houthis. We break down what Trump's win in Iowa really exposes. And we break down what one of the biggest threats to US soldiers actually is, which genuinely may shock you. And we've got even more to talk about, so let's just jump into it. Starting with the most batshit crazy story you're gonna hear about today. eBay got exposed harassing and terrorizing their opponents in the most wild ways. Right, to meet David and Ina Steiner. Back in 2019, their online newsletter, E-Commerce Bytes, it got the attention of eBay execs, but in a bad way. Because after Ina wrote a piece about a lawsuit in which eBay was accusing Amazon of poaching their sellers, eBay CEO at the time sent a message to another top executive about Ina saying, quote, if you are ever going to take her down, now is the time. Motherfucker sounded like he was calling in a hit. So that message made its way to James Ball, who was a senior director of safety and security. And he then recruited several other employees and served as the ringleader to the most bizarre intimidation campaign you can imagine. They created fake Twitter accounts to send threatening DMs. They doxed the Steiners. They encouraged strangers to show up at their house for sex parties. And they sent increasingly disturbing packages to their home. We're talking live spiders and cockroaches, a funeral wreath, a book about surviving the death of a spouse, a fetal pig, and a bloody pig Halloween mask. And that's just naming a few. Paul even tried to break into the Steiners' garage in order to put a GPS tracker on their car. But then also, check out this crazy psycho shit. Reportedly terrorized and intimidation wasn't the end game. That was just part one. With reportedly the plan for the eBay employees being that they would step in to help stop the harassment and give themselves kind of the shiny white knight appearance. But ultimately, the employees ended up getting caught and charged back in 2020 and 2022, with Ball getting almost five years in prison and another exec getting two, with then a grand total of seven employees and contractors receiving felony charges for their involvement. And obviously, everyone involved was also fired. So with that, you might have noticed that th it seems like someone is missing. And when you know it, the most powerful in the situation uh, did not have to deal with the consequences. With the former CEO not facing any charges. Because right, his lawyers successfully argued that his take her down statement, it was taken out of context. Though, he did step down back in 2019. And as far as the reason we're talking about this today, is that eBay has now agreed to pay $3 million to resolve the criminal charges brought against them by the Justice Department in connection to the case. That including stalking, witness tampering, and obstruction of justice. And as part of the deferred prosecution agreement, eBay accepted responsibility for their former employees' insanity. For the terms of the agreement, they have to have things like keeping an independent monitor around to oversee the company for three years. With this, acting Massachusetts U.S. Attorney Joshua Levy saying, eBay engaged in absolutely horrific criminal conduct. The company's employees and contractors involved in this campaign put the victims through pure hell in a petrifying campaign aimed at silencing the reporting and protecting the eBay brand. eBay's current CEO calling the 2019 harassment, quote, wrong and reprehensible and saying in a statement, since these events occurred, new leaders have joined the company and eBay has strengthened its policies, procedures, controls, and training. But understandably, the, the Steiners are not happy. Posting in a statement that they were frustrated that so few top executives of the company were charged in this situation and adding that eBay's actions against us had a damaging and permanent impact on us emotionally, psychologically, physically, reputationally, and financially. And we strongly push federal prosecutors for further indictments to deter corporate executives and board members from creating a culture where stalking and harassment is tolerated or encouraged. And so they've also filed a civil lawsuit against eBay in federal court, saying that the harassment completely upended their lives. And personally, I hope they get paid out, because what the actual fuck? How is this a real thing that happened? This is one of the most twisted reactions I've ever seen to bad coverage. And I mean, I don't even know what kind of price tag you could put on like that level of mind fuckery. But I'll actually pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts on the story? And also, what do you think eBay should have to pay out to these guys? And then in social media news that is connected to real world news, let's talk about Mia Khalifa. Because Mia Khalifa has been getting a lot of support, but also facing a lot of backlash after sharing a video of an interaction she had with a woman on social media. With her writing in that post, the Zionists are losing the plot. She followed me through the lobby, calling me slurs, and didn't stop the entire time she was waiting for her Uber pool at the antique jewelry fair. She's a vendor, something she made abundantly clear, so I guess this is what her business stands for. And in the video, you see this happen. That's right. Yeah. You proud of your I'm mom? Israel Chai. I'm Israel Chai. You see that? You waiting for the bus? Because I'm waiting for my valet. With a woman and her son then talking in the background for a bit, the son then takes his phone out potentially to film, and then Mia says, She got real quiet now. I'm Israel Chai. Get away from me. Your breath smells I'm awful. Israel oh my Chai. God. You smell like knockoff falafel. Also for some background, the phrase that woman keeps repeating means the people of Israel live. It's become a common phrase in many years, and it's been recently repeated at marches in support of Jewish people in Israel amid the war. And so we see all this in the clip, though of course we don't see the buildup that Mia wrote about. So with that, we've seen responses on both sides. Right, some loving that Mia was dunking on this woman, writing things like American Zionists constantly cry that they feel unsafe, yet they are the only ones empowered enough to openly harass people on the streets and call them all sorts of abusive slurs. But then on the other side, you had people condemn 
condemning me, both for her behavior and the decision to post the interaction. Well, so with this encounter and the reactions that we're seeing, like it's important to know that we're not kind of going into this blind. Because all of this comes as me has been very vocal in support of Palestine, which at times has resulted in backlash for some of her comments in the past, where she was actually dropped from Playboy back in October after making a handful of posts, one of which was right after the attacks on October 7th, where she called for, quote, the freedom fighters in Palestine to flip their phones and film horizontal. So especially in the court of public opinion, this is a fight that's been raging for a while. But with all that said, what are your thoughts and reactions to the, the main central video at hand here? And then Mr. Beast and Elon Musk. Remember how last week there were all those people that were like, oh my God, Mr. Beast just slammed Elon Musk, humiliated him in public. And my response was, no, that's, that's literally not what happened. Well, we just got confirmation that I was right, which is my favorite thing to be. As someone that is one eighth condescending D-bag. Because all that had happened was Elon Musk said, hey, Jimmy, maybe post videos here. Mr. Beast just said, you know, that wouldn't make monetary sense with things as they are right now. Elon then later saying that he was working on ways to increase creator payouts. And so yesterday, Mr. Beast said, hey, let's test this out. Let's get the data. And he uploaded his video called $1 car versus $100 million car. And writing, I'm curious how much ad revenue a video on X would make, so I'm re-uploading this to test it. We'll share ad rev next week. That video was uploaded last September. It got 211 million views. And as of recording, the video on Twitter has 61.2 million views. But as we always talk about with X, that is a public facing, overly inflated number. So we actually have no idea how many people have consumed this content. Versus, you know, they just scrolled past it. So we'll have to see how much or how little Mr. Beast makes from this. So there, there's also chatter of if the numbers are actually going to be real or not. Or some thinking Musk's just going to throw some extra cash Jimmy's way, so all of a sudden it kind of turns into this big promotion. And you know, while you have others saying, no, the numbers are going to humiliate Musk. Some have also claimed they got a pre-roll before the video. So on my team's end, we haven't been able to replicate that. We have not gotten a pre-roll before that video. But regardless, you know, it does make sense that this is happening. Especially with this happening during like this big time of change regarding creators making money with their video content. Especially as it pertains to short form content. With data collected by Creator IQ showing that there was a 700% increase year over year in brand partnership spending on YouTube shorts. TikTok and Instagram Reels also seeing bumps of 113% and 100%. But here's where I'll end this piece. With my feelings about places like X becoming an absolute dumpster fire over the last year aside, everything that we're talking about right now, it really only affects people that are already established content creators. But if you are a small or a starting creator, upload everywhere, regardless of if you like that platform or not. The only reason I have a large audience on TikTok, I was posting there before money was there. The only reason I have a YouTube audience, I was posting there before money was a thing. Because when the money is there, that's when the big wave comes. There's the money economy and then there's the attention economy. Those two will eventually work together because money follows attention, but attention is key. And while everything everywhere is more saturated than ever, the easiest way to break in right now is short form content. You just get more chances for people to see your content. And then there's even more news that we got to talk about today, but I got to take a second to pay some bills. Because holy hell, this flu season is no joke. I mean, I don't know a single person who hasn't been sick or been dealing with these long lasting symptoms for weeks. You know, maybe that sounds familiar to you. Maybe you're on the hunt for a new doctor. Maybe you're finding it hard to find someone who doesn't make you feel like cattle, you know, like a good doctor who gets you, listens to you, makes you feel super comfortable and doesn't take six months to get an appointment with. But the great news is I've got you covered or, or well, actually the fantastic sponsor of today's show has you covered. ZocDoc. ZocDoc is a free app and website where you can search and compare highly rated in-network doctors near you and instantly book appointments with them online. Right, Doctors who are right for you and take your insurance. We're talking about booking appointments with tens of thousands of top rated patient reviewed credible doctors and specialists. You know, the typical wait time to see a doctor booked on ZocDoc is between just 24 to 72 hours. Sometimes you can score same day appointments with doctors who have verified reviews from actual real patients, not bots. You know, the app's so easy to use and it's not just about finding your general practitioner. You can find specialists too. Dermatologists, dentists, psychiatrists, eye doctors, I can go on. I mean, hell, over the break, I used it to find a psychologist and they saw me same day. And I just cannot overstate how convenient it is. So just go to ZocDoc.com slash Phil and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then just find and book a top rated doctor today. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash Phil. ZocDoc.com slash Phil. And then the biggest threat to American soldiers may blow your mind. Our own weapons. I'll explain. Because all the way back in 2011, a team from DARPA, or the Pentagon's research agency, they decided to run an experiment. And they put all these little sensors the size of a quarter on 10,000 soldiers in Afghanistan. And they were looking to measure the blast exposure from roadside bombs. Because naturally to them, they're like, yeah, the IEDs planted by insurgents. That's the number one threat to US troops. Let's get the data. But when the data actually started rolling in, a whole different picture emerged. They found that 75% of the soldiers' blast exposure actually came from their own weapons. Things like grenades, rocket launchers, tanks, and artillery that deliver an enormous percussive boom. So with this, you have David Borkholder, the lead researcher on the study, telling the New York Times, it was hugely, hugely surprised. The danger was us. We were doing it ourselves. But then in 2016, the military just shelves the program, saying this data, it's, it's inconsistent. It's unreliable. Except Borkholder, he thinks that it just gave army leadership something they didn't want to hear. Namely, the military's most beloved heavy weapons. They're not just destroying their intended targets, but they're also destroying the minds of the people using them. With, for example, one DOD expert on the subject explaining, if the right kind of wave hits brain tissue, the tissue just breaks. It literally gets torn apart 
apart. We see that in the lab. And while the research suggests that soldiers appear to recover in a few days or a few weeks after a blast, right, similar to a concussion, like a concussion, that's incredibly bad. Because right? when they are subjected to these shockwaves over and over again, hundreds or even thousands of times throughout their deployment, the damage can become permanent. I mean, think about it like in the NFL, you have players retiring with insane amounts of brain trauma from repeatedly bashing their heads together. And so with data taken from soldiers firing shoulder-mounted rocket launchers over three years, not a shock, it showed that they had worse memories and reaction times, worse coordination, lower cognitive and executive function, and elevated levels of proteins in their blood that are markers of brain injury. But still, to this day, we don't have a reliable test for the mental trauma caused by blast exposure, which is also why it's often called an invisible injury. And it's also why symptoms are frequently misdiagnosed. They think it's simple PTSD or other psychiatric disorders. But in the last decade, veterans suffering from traumatic brain injuries, which there are at least 400,000 of them just since 2000, and that's probably an underestimate, they pressured Congress to study the effects of blast exposure from their own weapons. And in 2016, the Defense Department actually found a perfect natural experiment. Because the U.S. wanted to destroy the Islamic State in Syria, but they also wanted to minimize the number of boots on the ground. And so to do that, they relied heavily on airstrikes and artillery operated by just a handful of troops bombarding the enemy from miles away. But because of this strategy, those soldiers fired far more shells per person than any artillery crew since at least the Vietnam War. We're talking into the tens of thousands. And so the Marine Corps conducted a study on one of the hardest hit batteries published in 2019. And it found that more than half of the crew members, they eventually received diagnoses of traumatic brain injuries. With it warning that firing tons of rounds day after day, it could incapacitate crews faster than new crews could be trained to replace them. Yet the DOD did little to protect its soldiers. And actually, when they reported these issues, it didn't always take them seriously. I mean, just take the example of Christian Beyer. Christian worked with the M1 Abrams tanks for 23 years, eventually rising to the rank of Master Sergeant, was in charge of training young tank crews. But in 2020, when he was 38, as old as I am right now, he began to fall apart. His family telling the Times he couldn't sleep, he lost his balance, he slurred his words, he wept about small things and became paranoid about imagined conspiracies. There was one night he allegedly shoved his wife during an argument, he grabbed her a kitchen knife when a senior sergeant tried to calm him down. By this point, his wife said that she'd begun worrying that Christian had been exposed to too many tank blasts, and saying she told his command that he needed a thorough medical evaluation. But then, instead of sending him to one of the military's specialized brain injury centers, the DOD just court-martialed him for pushing his wife and other crimes. They jailed him, they reduced his rank, they forced him to retire last spring. And so then, with all his paranoia, Christian left his wife and kids and ends up wandering aimlessly around the country, leading to then other things like this dispute between him and two other men over parking in October. There he allegedly pulled a knife, then tried to run them over and fled. Multi-day manhunt eventually tracking him down. They arrest him on state and federal charges, though he pleads not guilty. But also, his case is just one of dozens that were investigated by the Times last year. And understand, by no means was that the most extreme. With reporter Dave Phillips finding soldiers who came back from deployment suffering from depression, panic attacks, even visual and auditory hallucinations. And time after time, they were misunderstood or brushed off, with so many of them just ending up homeless in a psych ward or dead from taking their own lives, or in a few cases, taking other people's lives. Do you remember back in October of last year, there was that gunman who opened fire at a bowling alley in a bar in Lewiston, Maine? He killed 18 people, that included children. And at that time, it was reported that he had been hearing voices and was actually involuntarily committed during the summer. But what we didn't know back then is he actually had worked for years as an instructor at an army hand grenade training range, with the soldiers from his unit saying he could have easily been exposed to more than 10,000 blasts. Now, I do want to say, with, with him as well as the other cases that we've talked about, it's impossible right now to know for sure that their mental issues were caused by the blasts. But it would sure be a coincidence that the Lewiston shooter began wearing hearing aids around the time that he started hallucinating. And again, we're talking about it just 39 years old. So recently, the state's medical examiner sent part of his brain to a lab to analyze it for maladies caused by repeated head trauma. And so now, thanks to these incidents and the Times reporting, the Pentagon has begun taking the issue more seriously, with it setting a limit above which weapon blasts are considered hazardous in 2022. Though a big caveat there, that limit was actually calculated using decades-old research on damage to soldiers' hearing, not their brains. Plus, it just simply measures a shockwave's peak peak pressure, putting the limit at four pounds per square inch, but blast exposure is much more complicated. Where some waves reach a high peak, but they pass quickly, while others, with maybe like a lower peak, they may just last longer and deliver more energy. But that's also just one thing the DOD is doing. It's like a bunch more steps in December. Things like reaching out to thousands of veterans, notifying veterans services offices about the potential injuries, and creating a website showing how to recognize traumatic brain injuries. But still, in the meantime, it appears that very little has actually changed on the ground for actual soldiers. Right, soldiers who are still using all the same weapons. Because to that point, you can't just have a military with no weapons, but there does have to be a better way, unless we're just fine with this being one of the costs of war. Though the answer to that question is probably a scary one, because based off of how our government treats veterans now, it appears that that is the case. You're a hero when they need you, and you're a zero when you're done. The government's like the worst friend we've all had. But with all that said, I love your opinions on this situation and those comments down below. And then, you know, things are hard to predict about 2024. Social media trends, what new gadgets are being released, what's happening with gas prices. Because, you know, a new year is full of surprises. But one thing 
thing that is predictable is that postage costs go up. So thank you to stamps.com slash Phil for being a sure thing and for sponsoring today's show. Stamps.com gives you crazy discounts of up to 89% off USPS and UPS services. So your business will barely notice the change. Are you selling products online? They seamlessly connect with major marketplaces and shopping carts. The Stamps.com has been convenient and cost-effective for me. I get all mailing and shipping done without even leaving my house. And taking care of orders on the go is even easier with their mobile app. You can print official U.S. postage from your computer 24-7. I mean, they even send you a free scale so you'll have everything you need. You need a package pickup? Easily schedule it through your Stamps.com dashboard. Plainly put, Stamps.com saves me time and money. It frees me up to be able to produce this show, create the awesome new designs for the next drop, and spend more time with my family. So go take a chunk out of your mailing and shipping costs this year with stamps.com. Just sign up at stamps.com slash Phil for a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage, a free digital scale, and no long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com slash Phil. And then Donald Trump will be the next president of the United States of America. That's what the numbers are saying right now. If the election happened right now today, you take into account the five key swing states that will decide the election, He's number 47. Though, of course, the election is a ways away. A lot can change from now till then. And last night, we got even more evidence that Republicans are behind him. Donald Trump absolutely dominating the Iowa caucus. I mean, literally half an hour into caucusing, the major networks called it poor. With Trump winning more than half of all the votes. DeSantis then coming in at a distant second at 21.2%. Nikki Haley right there with him with 19.1%. Vivek Ramaswamy coming in at fourth place. He also quickly suspended his campaign and endorsed Trump. And I mean, he won 98 out of Iowa's 99 counties. And even that last one, it's neck and neck. And who and where? where he thrived, it really wasn't surprising. He won many rural counties by 60 and sometimes even 70% of the vote. He also did well where voters were lower income and less educated, with Trump performing the weakest in cities, precincts with more moderates, and among voters with higher incomes and more education. Also, when we talk about evangelicals and uber-conservative voters, DeSantis got incredibly bad news, with Trump making huge gains with them, and that despite DeSantis really trying to hone in on just them. Where he campaigned ferociously in all 99 counties, spent millions of dollars, and was literally endorsed by the state's governor as well as prominent evangelical leaders. But all we kept kind of seeing in the polls is that like as more people met with DeSantis, the lower his numbers went. Seemingly all Trump had to do was go like, DeSantis has elf shoes and everyone was like, yeah, fuck that guy. So with this, there's reason to believe that things are just gonna get worse and worse for DeSantis. Because if there was anywhere DeSantis was gonna thrive, it would be in Iowa with its more conservative leaning GOP base. Though DeSantis, who, I mean, to his credit, has never been uh, held down by reality, uh, tried to say that this was a win, telling supporters we've got our ticket punched out of Iowa. Though I will say if there's anyone that can take their loss as kind of a win, it would be Haley. Because right? she actually did pretty decent among the base that she's been courting, winning 64% of self described moderates and showing a good deal of strength among college-educated, suburban, and independent voters. And that's really key there, because those specific groups are expected to push her way above DeSantis in the next few elections. So again, if we're being honest, we're talking about the reality of the situation. Other than with maybe, let's say, DeSantis and obviously Christie, these primaries seem to be more about like, hey, I could be your VP Trump, or at the very least, maybe I could get in your cabinet. And the only reason not DeSantis is things have at times gotten really ugly between the two. And one of the most obvious things that came from last night is that Trump made it clear that he doesn't see any of his Republican opponents as threats. I mean, he had so much distance, he called them very smart capable people and saying, we're going to come together. It's going to happen soon too. And again, unless something happens, he's going to exit these primaries in an incredibly strong fashion and he'll enter the general election further emboldened and flanked by people he was competing against in the primaries. And then we've got to talk about the crazy number of things that have gone down in the Middle East over just the last four days, starting with the Houthi situation, where they're a Yemeni rebel group. And they have continued to launch missiles at ships despite a huge strike by the US and UK last week. And following that attack, they said that American ships were actually legitimate targets and hit a US owned cargo ship followed by a Greek owned ship about a day later, both of which were traveling along the coast of Yemen. And while fortunately, it seems like no one got hurt, both vessels sustained damage and had increased international panic and concern. In fact, these attacks might be enough to actually push the EU to finally send warships to the region to help protect shipping. It also seems like the signs uh, that the Houthis, how do I say this, they do not seem to have any sense of self-preservation here, with prior attacks leading to the US and UK to heavily damage Houthi missile sites. And in fact, as I was recording this video, it's been reported that the US already launched another strike in response to the most recent attacks. Our Navy is also intercepting ships smuggling weapons to the group, with US Navy SEALs over the weekend boarding an unregistered vessel making its way over from Somalia. And on that ship, they had Iranian-made weapons parts, with the U.S. Navy saying in a statement that the seized items include propulsion, guidance, and warheads for Houthi medium-range ballistic missiles and anti-cruise missiles, as well as air defense-associated components. And going on to say that the initial analysis indicates that these same weapons have been employed by the Houthis to threaten and attack innocent mariners on international merchant ships transiting in the Red Sea. Now with this, I do want to say that, you know, stopping smuggling ships, that's actually something that the U.S. and other navies regularly do in the region. But part of the reason this specific part has been in the news, 
one, of course, the grander story around the Houthis. And two, because the Navy actually confirmed that it's still looking for two Navy SEALs that were lost at sea during the operation. And while the situation in the Red Sea is just bad enough on its own, I mean, it's important to know that the whole region seems to be getting progressively more destabilized. I mean, explosions were heard outside of a U.S. consulate in Iraq, only for then Iran to announce that it was behind the missile attacks, with them claiming that they were targeting Israeli spy headquarters in the Kurdish parts of Iraq. And then on top of that, they allegedly attacked ISIS-linked bases in Syria as part of a security and counterterrorism campaign, which it wouldn't be surprising if they were going after ISIS with all this happening, with ISIS having been behind an extremely deadly attack earlier this month in eastern Iran. But either way, the Iraqi government was angry and condemned the attacks, although the government there is so unstable that it really doesn't seem like they can do much in retaliation other than complain at the UN. And then moving to the west, you have the situations with Israel. Right over in northern Israel, there's ongoing tensions with Hezbollah, with continuing tit-for-tat attacks. So also notably, Hezbollah has been facing pressure from Hamas to do more, with Hamas accusing them of only joining the war against Israel symbolically. You also had Israel announcing that their war with Hamas would be winding down to a, quote, less intrusive phase. So that doesn't mean that things are going to stop, as Israel proved with an airstrike just hours after the announcement. So it's likely just a claim that it's going to be less intense. And this is Israel has continued to face pressure to stop its campaigns from allies. So sometimes that pressure has popped up in the form of dangling carrots, like with Saudi Arabia, for example. Their prime minister announced that the country would resume negotiations for normalized relations if Israel would just stop its war. Though it remains to be seen if that's actually going to be enough to convince the Netanyahu government to stop. Though, normalized relations with Saudi Arabia is a massive agenda piece for almost any Israeli government. But what happens from here on all these fronts, it remains to be seen. All of this is still developing, and so we'll have our eyes on it. And then, the, the final thing that I want to talk about today, it's more of a, a personal community thing, but it is an I'm sorry. Ugh, I hate those words. Also, I apologize. No ukulele for this. But I am sorry. It was brought to my attention that the at the end of Thursday, I said that I'll see you Monday. Completely forgetting in that rushed moment to get the video out that we were not going to be here on Monday for MLK Junior Day. When the team gets that day off also, I was like, I'm not going to try and work through it because I already worked through the last week six. So my apologies for the confusion. I know schedule-wise we're perfect 99.9% .9 of the time, but as a viewer, that can be annoying. But that is where I'm going to end this video for you. As always, thank you for watching, like, and being a part of this community. My name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces, and I'll see you tomorrow.